All right. Hello, everyone. I am joined today on my uh, series of interviews by Shane Hensley, who has done quite a lot over his years of design. One of the things he's probably known best for is creating the Deadlands game, a, a series of weird West role playing, which is particularly interesting to me in this series of interviews I'm doing with designers because it's been something that's been in continual production for a long time. It's seen different editions and I think is a great encapsulation of some of the ways that game design has changed over the years from the original Deadlands, which was more detailed on rules and had some more flavor, but now the Savage Worlds version has seen its own different iterations and experimentation. Uh, again, thank you so much for sitting down to speak with me today. Glad to be here. So I want to just get started by hearing what got you started in tabletop design and get the dog out of the way. Um, you know, what got, what got you started? You've been in for a while and doing it pretty consistently, which is something I don't think many people have been able to achieve. So um, I started back in high school after playing D&D, of course, like, like most people. <clears throat> this would have been um, early, mid-80s. And when the Marvel superhero game came out, between that and D&D, and &D, I designed my own scenarios, and that kind of led into uh, making my own worlds and settings. I did, uh, or, or copying them from films I was interested in. I did a Mad Max setting using the, the Marvel rules and ran it for my friends. For D&D, &D, this is back in second edition, of course, uh, I had this huge adventure called Quest for the Holy Grail and ran that for my friends. So, you know, I started in high school. Professionally, I was in college and uh, West End Games was taking submissions, which was fairly rare at the time, for a game called Torg. And I sent it in, and uh, Greg Gordon, who was running the line at the time, sent back a, a handful of notes, and I did the work, fixed it, sent it in, and they published it. And from that day on, I just kept going. Um, and Torg is an interesting game because it's, it's one of those settings where there's sort of everything going on. It's got sci-fi yeah. and fantasy, uh, a, a big mixture of you know un universes colliding together and con conflicting. Um, and you dialed that back a bit in Deadlands, which is also an interesting setting because it covers a lot of ground where it's horror and also history and also science fiction. Um, I'm, what I would like to know is, from your perspective as someone who's been involved for so long, what the biggest changes have been in your time uh, designing games. I, I know that there have been many trends you've seen come and go, and you know, you've been at the, the forefront of some of them yourself. Yeah, so there's a lot. Um, so system-wise, when when I designed the original Deadlands, um, besides just you, you were very kind in saying more detailed rules. <laughs> I mean, they were pretty they were pretty clunky. Uh, but that was kind of, uh, as the Simpsons would say, that was the style at the time. Uh, but maybe ours are even even clunkier than than others. But you know, it was the first attempt. We wanted to get all the dice in there. We wanted um, gunslingers in Deadlands to have multiple actions and really mimic that um, feel of chunky hits from things like the Outlaw Josie Wales or any of the Spaghetti Westerns. By the time we got to Deadlands Hell on Earth, which is the post-apocalyptic version where the bad guys have won, and you start having things like automatic grenade launchers and vehicles and air support and all this kind of stuff, those rules were just way too too clunky. And, you know, those of us who played it for a while, we, we could run it just fine. But it was clear it was a barrier to entry for a lot of people. So um, we did a miniatures game called The Great Rail Wars. And that uh, used a single die per uh, attribute skill, whatever you were checking, plus a, a wild die. And the wild die idea came from the Star Wars RPG from West End Games, where I was working. And it gave it a it gave it a bell curve, right? While still cutting it down to one die as opposed to the handful of dice you would roll in Deadlands. And that led into to Savage Worlds. And it's it's been Savage Worlds since two thousand and three. And we think you know the system's held up all all this time. So that's pretty nice. So system wise, we started uh, a little clunky and we tried to streamline and get better and better and better at it. And I think our current version really shows that. We also feel like 
you, you could say that the next step would be a truly uh, narrative system. And we've played around with that. We've had some spinoffs. Uh, you can find them on our site. Jim Pinto did them for us. And those are fine and those are fun. We think they don't have quite the crunch feel that, that we want to most of our games. We run most of our games very narratively. But then when we want to fall back and have the crunch, when it becomes important, we like to have it there. And, and, it, and it does. So that's on the, the design side. Uh, publishing wise, when we did the original Deadlands, it was very important. And, and, and again, the way things were done to have splat books. And I don't just mean that from like a crass marketing, making money point of view. It was we wanted hucksters, which are our, our sorcerers, to feel very different from shamans, for example, and very different from mad scientists. So each uh, arcane background is what we call them got their own class book, right? This would be akin to second editions, you know, cleric books and magic user books and so on. So we did that and we had some really interesting and fun systems like the the way that Native Americans cast magic in the Ghost Dancers book is really cool and unique. However, again, what we found over time was there are now seven different systems, right? From voodoo to black magic to hucksters and so on. And that became a lot, especially for the game master to keep track of. You as a player, it was probably pretty easy because you had your one book and your one character, but it became a lot to keep track of and balance against each other. So in Savage Worlds, we decided, you know, and this came, I did a lot of work for Dungeons and Dragons, primarily uh, Dark Sun, Ravenloft. And one of the books I did was uh, Earth, Fire, Water, and Air for Dark Sun. And I had to create tons of powers for the clerics in Dark Sun. And my editor went through it with me and he said, well, we want, here's the progression of the spell through the levels. And then we just want to make it feel different. We just wanted to have different trappings, right? But it's essentially the same spell as you go up in levels. So I did that. And then by the time I got to, to Savage Worlds, we started, you know, that, that came back to me. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then why don't we have the same mechanics for everything? but you, you change how you describe it. And that will have some game effects, but primarily, you know, if I'm going to hurl a bolt or a projectile or whatever of energy at you, it's pretty much the same. And then as I get more powerful, maybe I can put more power points is how we do it, uh, energy into it, et cetera, to make it do more damage and so on, right? So we, we coalesced our, all these different, what we would call splat books back in the day, you know, different powers into one power system that the GM and the players can tinker with, call whatever they want. So you can call it a magic missile, you can call it a fireball, it all just depends on how you cast it in Savage Worlds. So there's the, the publishing aspect. And then I guess there's, there's kind of three main legs to this, right? The business aspect has changed dramatically over time. So when we started, uh, Back in 96, distributors would put in pretty good orders with us. We were very lucky and were a hit out the gate, so we'd get these great orders, but they were really slow to pay. And cash flow for a small company like that is, is a big problem, right? Especially when you are pretty successful and you have big print runs to handle. So you, know, you got to pay for all these books and then pray that they're going to sell. And if you're not getting paid in time from the distributors, it's a real problem. So then now, magic speaking um, with the uh, creator of burning wheel, who's also talking about the, just the large chunk that the distributor of the retailer takes away from your product yeah. and, and on its own, that's huge. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I value distributors. I value platforms like DTRPG, but drive through takes 35%. Distributors always took 60. All right. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot that we give up to these other partners and, and I'll come back to that. I'll try to wrap this up, but, um, <laughs> we started again the distributors wouldn't pay so well magic comes along and suddenly the distributors are flush with cash but the thing they want to buy is more magic and then later pokemon right and then various iterations of dungeons and dragons pathfinder whatever the hit was at the time you know when 3.0 came out that was the big hit etc so our distributors stopped ordering very much but they did pay on time so mixed blessing right and what we found was if our books weren't in the warehouse, the stores couldn't get them. If they had to wait two, four weeks to get something, they just they just stopped ordering. So we started seeing our, our sales in stores decline. The Internet was rising as a, as a real sales tool then. So we started doing more direct sales. 
And then PDFs came along and we used to sell, people may not remember, but drive through RPG and RPG now were two different sites and we sell on our own site. PDFs were a big deal, but they also alienated some retailers, right? The retailers would say, well, why would I sell somebody a book for 20 bucks when they can buy it on your website as a PDF for eight? Well, that, that was a, a thing at the time that we thought was going to be a real problem, much like people thought theaters would go out of business, you know, 10 years ago because of stream, right? And that proved not to be the case. The next big sea change for us was the, the D20 boom and bust. So D20 comes in, sucks all the oxygen out of the room for a few years. We dual statted Deadlands uh, Classic, what we called it, with uh, the D20 system when we did a Deadlands D20. And our fans um, didn't like that. They said that we were taking up all this content in their books with D20 stuff. The D20 people uh, never really embraced us because we weren't a fantasy game. So that, that wasn't a great time for us. And then the bus came and all the, the distributors and retailers were out of, out of money, right? So they, they just didn't have a lot of money to order. The next big change was Kickstarter. And moving to direct sales has been huge for all of us in, in the tabletop role-playing game industry because of what you just mentioned. So when we sell a book to a store, first we sell it to the distributor at anywhere between 55 and 60% off the cover price, right? And then they turn around and sell it to a store for like 40 or 45 percent off the cover price. So uh, that that's a big hit to take. And at, when we started, you know, it's mostly uh, thin 128 page books with black and white art. Now the Kickstarter age comes along and you've got to do to compete with the big guys. You know, you got to do hardbacks, full color. Uh, artist costs have gone up. So we we've, we've we've met that challenge by moving primarily to Kickstarter, which is where we sell most of our stuff these days. We sell it there first to get the print run covered. Then we sell it into retail. There are exclusives for you know fans to stick with us. There's exclusive for stores sometimes, but it changed the model greatly where now we're getting 100% of the cover price. We often lose a little bit in shipping because shipping, you know, by the time you charge it, the book comes in and then you sell it. The shipping has gone up, so we lose a little there, but generally we're making a lot more than we used to. We also sell a lot less than we used to. Interesting. So you asked me the question, there's the long answer. Yeah, and I so I have heard from designers before that one of the main advantages of Kickstarter is you get a much better picture of how many books you need to produce because right. it's, it's equivalent to the people who are going to be Kickstarting it. And then afterwards... Um, I don't know what it looks like after that point. You probably have an idea of, of how many you want to do with the extra print run. I, oh, sorry. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how you get those figures or how you try to gauge once the main Kickstarter is over, what else you yeah, think so you need to produce. That's, that's experience building that long tail, right? So it, it, on a, on a core release for most of our settings, we'll generally order five times what we sell on Kickstarter. And we'll sell that within a year, year and a half, and then we'll do a reprint. If it's a core book like um, the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, we've we've now reprinted that five times and a sixth printing is coming in. So that's that's well over, I don't remember exactly, well over 100,000 books. Something like Deadlands, you know, we've gone through many printings of that. So, you know, we look at the data for the last release. We look at how many people ordered it in the Kickstarter? You know, if it's a, if it's a low backer count, then we don't order as many because we know it's going to be harder to sell. And reprints are tough, especially if it's a, a low printing thing because it's we don't crowdfund reprints; we just pay for those ourselves, and uh, that can be pretty tricky. But it's way better than the old days when we would order five thousand books and then pray they sold. Yeah, um, it's impressive that anyone like yourself has has made it considering the difficulties in front of you especially when you were starting out when i mean there is a much wider market for it now it's much more visible what role playing is and why it's attractive but in the 80s and 90s it was still very underground and there were people who were kind of act actively campaigning against it um, um are you talking about like the satanic panic stuff? Well, yeah, that's that would be one of it. I, um, I also remember I saw a 60 minute story on how D and D leads to real life violence in teenagers, which is amazing yeah. because usually 60 minutes does great reporting, but that story was just rank sensationalism. Yeah, 
So I lived in the Midwest during all that, and uh, we played D and D. I went to a, a church group, a church youth group. We played it there, and the 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 staff all loved it. We played it in the talented and gifted program in in elementary school. So I never saw any of that. I, I know it existed in in some corners, uh, and that was between Ohio and the Mid South in in Virginia, where I uh, was later raised. There were never any problems with it there. But I know there were some places, but I think it probably among the generation who didn't live through it, it might seem a little over exaggerated than it really was. And their sales were through the roof at the time, right? So it was good for it. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't really aware of your personal history before. It was was where you were raised part of what influenced you to release this game that was about um, the history of, of the early American West? Um, no, I'd never been out West. Uh, I'd been to California a few times. I have a lot of relatives there, but I'd never been to the West West as I am now. I live in Arizona now, but, uh, I grew up watching John Wayne movies with my dad. And, and then I was inspired by this piece of art that Brom did for a vampire, uh, a book. It was called, it was later called Necropolis Atlanta, but I saw it as the cover of a White Wolf magazine at Gen Con. And that idea just stuck with me and I already loved Westerns. And I loved horror. And uh, I, I think Evil Dead 2 is the pinnacle of human achievement, for example. So it was always <laughs> hard to argue with. Horror. Yeah, right. It was always a campy horror for me and merged that with a little John Wayne. And, and I didn't get introduced to Clint, to Clint Eastwood and Spaghetti Westerns until after until I was in college. So those were pretty new to me when I did that. Movies. Uh, and for anyone curious, look at the cover of that book and then look at Jasper Stone, one of the main characters of the uh, the sort of metafiction of Deadlands. Yeah, that was. There's a quick, interesting story there. So I asked, actually had asked Brom. So the idea in my head, driving back from Gen Con, that I had was this uh, hand popping up out of a grave at Boot Hill, right? And the idea was, what was so important to this guy that he came back from the dead for? And when I asked Brom to do the cover, I said, uh, you know, when an undead gunslinger bursting up out of the grave, what we got is is not that at all. And when I got it, oddly enough. You know, in hindsight, I was very disappointed. And the um, the picture that he did of Jasper Stone had had the badges with the holes in it, right? So he was clearly the bad guy, and I wanted our hero on the cover. So I was kind of heartbroken for a day or two. But then finally, you know, some fr- I showed it to some friends, and they were just wild by it. And I said, you know, it is beautiful. It's not what I asked for, but it is beautiful. We used it. We sent it out as posters to game stores, and it was probably the most successful marketing thing I've ever done. And then it sold great into distribution right from the start. And, and it is a great encapsulation of the the tone and the ethos of Deadlands, that first cover of Jasper Stone, um, who has remained maybe the most popular character in the setting and, and had his hands yeah. in, in different pieces of the development. Um, and what has it been like... You know, I'm sure you had no idea when you started how large it would grow, that it would have this longevity, but also that you would continue to develop the setting for close to 30 years at this point. Yeah, I, I certainly had no idea. And, and and I can prove it because Deadlands Hell on Earth was conceived right from the start as, you know, we'll do this game for two or three years and then we'll blow it up in Deadlands Hell on Earth, which was supposed to be a direct sequel, not an alternate timeline. But since Deadlands was so successful, we were having so much fun with it. We, you know, we were able to to take those and make them two different settings. But you know, we were told, "Hey, westerns don't sell, and the RPG industry is in the toilet right now." So, as a favor to you, Shane, from several distributors, we'll order some, but we don't think it's going to sell. So I was like, "Okay." We printed, um, I think we printed five thousand softbacks and a thousand hardbacks in that very first print run, and uh, and we thought that would last us forever. And it turned out those lasted us about a month. And, and of course, uh, you, the work you've created has grown so much larger than that because Savage Worlds is such a great toolkit. You've been able to expand it to other settings. Um, Rifts probably being one of the more recognizable ones that, that people would know about. Uh, has it? Is it difficult to maintain the, the love that you have for designing and creating games when it it gets that large that you have to do so much work just to just to produce the books, to manage people, uh, you know, to, to continue keeping the design alive. 
No, I, I, I truly do enjoy the challenge, and I play our game all the time, and I enjoy playing it. Um, each one has been a, a very interesting and fun challenge. So with Pathfinder, for example, Savage Pathfinder, we, we didn't want classes, but we wanted to mimic the things that classes do. And it's not just a fun design challenge. It's important to the world, because in the world, clerics have a particular role. Right, fighters have a particular a particular role. Monks have a role, and they they are called such in the adventures. And we wanted to be able to translate those. And I think bringing in what we call class edges, which are they they take characters and give them the same flavor as something with a class, but you're not rigorously bound into a class structure. That was a lot of fun to figure out. Um, Rifts was just insane. Rifts is insane, right? Yeah, and. Trying to make sure that a glitter boy with a gun that can, you know, bring down a building was was a a fair thing to play compared to a juicer or a crazy was was quite a challenge. And I think I think that was mostly the rest of the team on that one. And I think they did a fantastic job. I'm working on the science fiction companion now, and that's a crazy challenge, right? Because fantasy is a is a fairly narrow genre, but science fiction is. Jeez, it's just huge. And so many different interpretations and takes. And the people who are advocates of a particular take are very strong advocates <laughs> for it. Yeah. You know, Star Wars is better than Star Trek. This is how shields work. Photon torpedoes work like this. And we need to give them the tools to, to do all those things. Yeah, and Savage Worlds is very much a, a toolkit in that every companion, companion you do has so many different options for how people can modify it as opposed to D and D, which is a lot more rigid. Uh, it doesn't have those kinds of optional rules. The companions do, right? So within a setting, we decide this is how things work. So in lost colony, uh, deadlands, lost colony, we know exactly what missiles do, right? Uh, we know exactly what kind of guns are present and what aren't present and so on. But in the science fiction companion, we don't know what you're trying to emulate. You may be trying to emulate Shadowrun or Star Trek or aliens or whatever, and we've got to give you that you know, that wide range of things and make sure they work reasonably well together. And there's a, there's a real trick there, especially with sci-fi, because a science fiction setting may decide that the discovery of this particular mineral, for example, makes this kind of weapon very common to use. Whereas in a generic sense, that weapon is so much better than everything else or so much worse than everything else, but we still got to include it and make it somehow comparable to the other things. And is it, um, when you're creating these things, are you attempting at all to make it consistent with itself? Which is to say, if I'm playing Savage Worlds, it's easy enough for me to take elements from the horror and sci-fi companions, but you're also doing things like making Rifts books alongside tons of other settings. Um, in some cases, you know, you've, you've done Pathfinder. You've done, um, I did a little bit of writing on some of the books you've done based on comics. Is that, is the balance between those something that comes naturally from the fact that all the math is sort of going to work out the same, or is it something that takes a lot of work to wrangle as you're creating new settings? It's, uh, so we, we do strive for consistency between them with the acknowledgement that something like in Rifts, you play more powerful characters. But a missile in Rifts, if it has the same name as a missile in something else, will do the same damage. That, that's what we strive for. If not, we try to call it something else, right? This is a atomic warhead. This is not just a, you know, a sidewinder or something. So that's that's something we do strive for, again, within the, within a setting. Like, for example, Pathfinder fantasy characters start as, as plus four characters. If, you're, if anybody you know, plays the game and are familiar with that, they have a couple of more advantages than stock fantasy characters. Right? And that's a conceit of the game world to make them equivalent to what we picture the class being in the world. What we're really trying to do is model the feel of that world. We, we, we tell it to a lot of our licensees a lot because it's something we learned early on. You need to adapt the setting, not the rules, right? So if Pathfinder has a particular rule for how magic items work, that's great. We want to get that feel, but it will probably work on a different scale and with different numbers in Savage Worlds. 
Is there, um, you know, one of the things I really haven't seen anybody talk about is just how that works, keeping the math balance. Is there a document somewhere where, like a setting document, someone wants to write for Deadlands, you say that, you know, these are the facts of the setting. Is there something like this, this is the math behind how a power works and what you should keep in mind when you're trying to develop something for a Savage Worlds compatible product? No, I mean, we have that for vehicles, ships, that kind of thing. But as far as, uh, I guess it's a yes and no. So like, you know, an edge needs to be a two point ability generally. And we do have a point scale for things. And that that originally derived from uh, uh, racial traits, which are now ancestral traits. So, you know, we know what a point of toughness is worth, right? We know what an attribute bump is worth. We know what a, uh, the ability to fly at different speeds is worth, right? So we've, we've honed that in pretty close, and we use that as a guide to say, well, this, this edge that you're proposing gives people, you know, three or four points of abilities as opposed to two. So I guess there is. I don't really – I guess I usually think of it backwards. I think of what I want the edge to do, and then I make sure the math works out rather than – building it from the math, but I guess it's the same thing. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's helped to a degree by what you were describing before, that Savage World is very good at giving you something like a generic power. This does 2d6 damage, but you have all of the uh, the trappings on top of it that will adjust the flavor. And then with the newest, newest edition, there are more complicated ways that people can modify right. powers and abilities on top of it. Right, and it's very setting dependent too, right? I mean, being an outlaw in Dark Sun is very different than being an outlaw in Planescape, right, or Deadlands. It, it depends on are you going to go into the places where that's going to be a problem or outsider at the edge, right? A lot of the role-playing uh, hindrances, for example, really just matter how much the GM pays attention. Do you go to places where that comes into play, et cetera? And sometimes people will say that uh, you know, a role-playing hindrance isn't worth a physical hindrance. And I, I disagree completely, right? If, if you wound up getting thrown in jail for an adventure because you got the wanted hindrance, that's going to be much uh, more impactful than maybe your toughness is one less point and you didn't even get in combat that, that encounter or that, that evening. Well, and I always thought it was such a smarter way to handle character drawbacks rather than you get a benefit at character creation and work as hard as possible to make sure it never comes up again. In the Savage Worlds system, you are rewarded for having bad things happen to you because of your hindrances. So That's it right. is your choice, but it, there's good reason for letting your character's flaws be something that influences them. Right. Um, and in terms of I mean, your work has been pretty expansive. Savage Worlds covers a lot of ground, and people have also released their own settings for it that have it really expanded its its tone and its settings. Has there ever been anything where um, you thought, and anything that hasn't worked out? Maybe somebody came to you and you said that wouldn't be a good a good fit for Savage Worlds, or. Um, or just something that you were working on that you ended up thinking wouldn't work out. No, I think I think we've shown now we can make anything work, um, and you know we we've talked about the high scale supers, rifts, that kind of thing. But on the low scale, one of the first books we did was Andy Hop's Low Life. There you play irradiated Twinkies and other strange uh, items of human detritus that were left over after an apocalypse. You are tiny creatures, right now. I think at that level, you're not going to have as much variability in actual s statistics as you do at higher levels. But that's never really been uh, the thing we hang our hat on anyway, right? Your, your differences really come from your edges and hindrances and in your actions, you know, how you act. So, no, nothing's ever come up that uh, I thought wouldn't fit with the game. I think we take, uh, just like everybody else, we take lessons from our peers and say, this is a really cool idea. What might it look like in our game? That way, you know, it's an homage rather than ripping somebody off. Like, I think tension in uh, the Aliens game, right? That's a really cool idea. And if we, had a, if we were doing an Aliens-style game, we'd find our own take on it, but we'd be, we'd be inspired. Is any of the design influenced by the fact that virtual tabletops are now much more common? I, I was playing a classic Deadlands game a, a while ago, and I was thinking, like, the fact that all of these things are auto-calculated 
in a much more complicated game makes it much easier to play. Um, it's not great because I wouldn't necessarily actually understand what was happening with things like the amount of wind I was taking, but it was easier right. for those calculations to be made. Um, we definitely consider it to some degree. We, we, when we're proposing a new mechanic or the way something's work, we do actually stop and say, is this going to be a real hassle for the VTT team to, to handle? Um, but we still err on the side of what's going to be fun at the tabletop because the VTT side can handle, as you just mentioned, some automation, depending on which platform you're using. That can be done pretty easily. But we need to be able to let you, the game master, do quick calculations, math, dice rolls, whatever you need to do, while still focusing on the players in the story, right? And that's that's our that's really our long pull on every every game. It's easy to to work through how something should work in a complicated fashion. The next step then is let's boil all that down to something simple that a, a GM can handle at the table while he's handling five rowdy players. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it was Einstein who said. If you can't explain something in a simple way, you don't really understand it. That's a that's a great philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> Does it make it more difficult that there are different competing VTTs? Because I, I know that um, yes, you, you can get Savage World materials on multiple ones, but that means it's going to take more from you to work out the licensing and how it actually gets to the end user. Yeah. So. Um... Formerly Sigil, now Metamorphic does all of our VTT work that, that we do and sell, and that's where we do the, uh, the, the the packaging of all that stuff and some systemic work. Uh, something like Roll20, we tend to just provide the assets, and then they're put into a bundle, and the GM uses them, you know, in, in however that, that platform wants to use it. But it is, it is definitely more difficult that they all work in, in such different ways. Fantasy Grounds is another one. They're they're great though because they do all the work for us. We just give them the raw materials and they handle it. They're they're great partners. It's a steeper learning curve for their software, but as you mentioned, it's one of the ones that does do a lot of the um, systemic work behind the screen, behind the scenes for you. And it was it was Fantasy Grounds Deadlands that convinced me that VTTs are a good idea because before I was like, this is just, it's, I can do everything at the table. There's no reason not to. The Savage World sheet is so simple, but then having all of those things come up and calculated automatically with a nice interface that, that's, um, that has a good, a good Deadlands background did make a big difference for the experience. Good. Um, I'm also, these are going to be some very broad questions, but I, I'm just, I would like to know your thoughts on how some of the emerging trends might impact your work or might not. I know people are very worried about AI. Um, Wizards of the Coast's hold on the market is something else that's concerning people. But I, you know, I've heard anecdotally that a lot of, um, I was going to say independent producers, but Pinnacle has been around for a long time. I don't know if I can really say that, but how, how that's been influenced by the fact that people are now looking in other directions for games where they might have just stuck with D and D before 2023. That is a broad subject. Uh, <laughs> let's let's start with AI. Uh, I, there, I think there are, are two factors to consider with AI. One, um, I'd, I'd consider a pro. The people who want to use AI for us are the artists that we already work with. So they want to use it and then touch it up themselves and add you know add their flair to it. We would be fine with that, except for part two, which is, I think it is unclear which ones, to, to use the vernacular, I realize this is much deeper than I'm going to spell it out here, use other people's work, yeah. right? And, and we don't want that. We want, we want original works, and I believe, I believe that day is, is going to come. Then we have to decide what, what's the, what are people going to think about it? Right. It's, it's the public reaction to it because it's such a, a buzzword right now that the moment you say it, everybody gets upset or a lot of people get upset. We don't use it, but I would like to allow our artists that freedom to use it as a tool, just like they've used Photoshop and ZBrush and a hundred other tools you know, throughout throughout my career. Yes, this one is, is much more intense and uh, pervasive or will be pervasive than, than those. But I, I, I would like to leave that up to the individual artist. 
and you know we'll we'll still pay them the same that same that we paid them before. They'll have uh, they'll be able to work much faster. I don't know when that day is coming, but I think it is coming. I think it's going to happen. And it's just like uh, when you're probably too young to remember, but uh, people were stealing songs from file sharing sites, right? And that was that was super common. It was everywhere because people couldn't get individual songs or whatever excuse you wanted to make. And then you know, Napster became legitimate and you could buy songs for a buck a piece. And then suddenly then we've got iTunes and Amazon Music and Google Music. And that's that's the path of progress, right? People are gonna do what they're gonna do. We need to accommodate that, make it a make it make that pathway legal and viable for them. How does AI fit into that? I'm I'm not the guy to know, but I do know our artists want to use it. I'd like to let them use it when it becomes appropriate to do so. That time's not yet. Uh, your other question was really more about, you know, how's the industry going? So I don't know if you're, if you are familiar with Ben Riggs, he wrote a, a really cool book called Slaying the Dragon, which was about the, the history of D&D. And Ben it's actually, I think the second time this week I was recommended that book. Uh, I was talking to, book. I was interviewing someone else earlier this week. Yeah, it's a great book. It's right here on my shelf, I believe. But um, Ben just posted a, a fairly apocalyptic view of the industry on his uh, on his Facebook page, and I think he can correct me, you know, in, in out there if he if he wants to. But I think that the gist of it was. D and D has been the gateway to role playing for the D and D five E specifically for the last how long has it been out five six years nine years I think twenty fifteen oh, wow. or so it was released flies. yeah so it's brought all these people in and his point and several others are that people under thirty that is all they're playing they are not gravitating to other systems and as D and D pulls away from traditional tabletop into whatever D&D 1, D&D Next, etc. is going to be an online animated experience, they are not going to play traditional role-playing games. So I don't know if that's right or not. I know we're going to keep doing what we're doing for a while. We will watch that trend. And if it's true that traditional role-playing outside of D&D is, is drying up with people over the age of 30 and, and people are going to age out of it and it's not going to be a thing, we'll figure out something else to do. But right now, you know, our game's selling well. We love it. We're enjoying it. We've got some pretty cool stuff on the horizon. So that's that's what we're going to keep doing. But we realize, just like those earlier changes I mentioned to you, the, the D20 boom and bust uh, change to the distrib distribution system because of Magic and Pokemon, PDFs, Kickstarter, you know, another C change is probably coming. It always does. Yeah. Well, and it's it's difficult to get a handle on because um, this is a niche market. With how even with how great it's grown in the past few years, there aren't that many people that are in it, and there aren't that many people that are reporting in it. And it's not something like film where you get widespread um, box office numbers or financial data. You know, we're doing a lot of guesswork, and right. I can talk about what I know anecdotally, but that's just with the people who are in my personal sphere of influence. Um, and I also, yeah. I don't know if. Sorry, I was just going to say it's important to realize, too, that, you know, there's there's the vast majority of RPG companies and what they sell. And then there are the occasional Matt Colvilles, right, with a, a huge yeah. four million dollar Kickstarter. We need to realize that is not the norm. Right. right. Kudos to Matt. Fantastic work. But it's not the norm. Most companies sell, you know, far less than a thousand copies. We're uh, of anything. We're very fortunate in that regard. It's also specifically interesting that I do know, again, this is anecdotal, but plenty of people get really excited and they kickstart something and then it sits on a shelf and they don't keep up with it. And if you're trying to own a game company and could produce something consistently, you need people to continue to be engaged with it. I think that's, that's what right. Wizards of the Coast is trying to do with its virtual tabletop, make it something yeah. that people have, as they, as their CEO referred to, recurrent spending like video games. But um, whether that works out is a different question. Right. I think you're dead on. And it's, it's one of the, the nice advantages we have. We don't have a, a massive population like D&D &D does, but we have a very, very uh, loyal core group that supports us well enough to keep us in business. 
And you know, again, the question is, how long does that last? Do we age out of it uh, over the years? Don't know. Yeah. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. I, I want to make sure I ask before I, I sign us off, is there anything that you have coming up that you want people to keep an eye out for? And, and where are the best places to follow your work and Pinnacle Entertainment? Awesome. Well, thank you. So we do. We have a big experimental project for us coming to GameFound called Doom Guard. Doom Guard is uh, the, the elevator pitch is Supers versus Cthulhu. And it is actually born out of our Necessary Evil universe. Necessary Evil is a game where all the good guys are wiped out, superhero world, and uh, villains have to step up and save the world. Now, Doom Guard is after that particular event, but the, it is still the heroes and villains have to get together to save the world. And while Cthulhu is actually the, the, the core villain in the first set, we're not just doing mythos stuff. We actually have an invasion from hell that's all set up to go, and we have an alien invasion that Vasori from Necessary Evil are in the third expansion. Those are actually already designed and written. But I thought Necessary Evil was the coolest game I'd ever played. It is damn And now cool. I'm hearing about this. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. So uh, you can go to GameFound and look for Doom Guards, two words. And if you follow it, you'll actually get a free mini if you wind up backing it. Uh, we're, we're super excited about that, but we also know that when RPG companies try to do board games, it has been a very difficult uh, thing to do. So you know, we're, ab we're absolutely asking for support from our fans to come over, give us a shot, and let us bring that into the board game world. And if that works out, we've got a Deadlands board game in the, in the works that you know, we really want to bring out for people. But it's a well, little it bigger, it's going to take more effort. And, and it's, it's funny because Deadlands grew out of the Great Rail Wars, and That's you're right. now co kind of coming full circle releasing board games. Uh, is that going to have similar mechanics of uh, the underlying yeah, set of it's worlds? actually a completely original design made exclusively for board games to take advantage of, you know, what people want to do in board games. That was a big question we asked ourselves is, do we want to emulate the RPG experience in a board game of Savage Worlds, or do we just want to make the best board game possible? but make it feel something like an RPG. And we went with the latter. And it really does play well. There's um, playthrough videos on the GameFound site. We've taken it to conventions from Wisconsin to Texas and several other places and played it with people. And I have played through the campaign twice. I love it. I'm looking forward to playing expansions, which I haven't done yet, but the playtest groups have. So we're pretty excited about that. But it's also a big risk for us. You know, the board game market is very crowded, very competitive. So we're, we're a little scared about the business side, but we believe 100% in the design. Right. Uh, well, I am looking forward to following that and seeing where it goes. I'm going to have links to everything in the description below. Shane Hensley, again, thanks so much. It's been great playing your games for many years of my life and now being able to, to talk to you about them. I sincerely hope this is not the last time we hear from one another. Awesome. Thanks, John. Glad to be here. Um, I'm going to stop recording.